all goes on. Ah, uh, some jerk shaving. Hey, cut off that lawnmower. Relax, Junior. I've got a date with the Queen of Sheba. She's allergic to beer. Are you silly? Take it easy. I'll fix it. Frequency modulation, or FM, is a big step forward in radio. When you tune in, you hear what the studio mic hears. No heterodyne squeal. The guy with the electric razor can use it all he wants. A GI can dial his girl's number. All these things in the same area, but they won't bother reception. <laughs> well, you've seen what FM means to ordinary everyday reception. But what's its military value? Just this. Until the Army turned to FM for some of its installations, radio interference was a communication headache. Sets out on the battlefield picked up static. Static that hashed up the incoming signal. Tank tracks created static that made reception damn near impossible. Then there are teletypes, battery chargers, armored cars, tanks. The material of modern war, as well as such natural phenomena as storms, created enormous amounts of electrical interference. Frequency modulation licks this problem, and that's why we want you to know something about it. Now, the best way we can explain FM is to compare it with AM, meaning, of course, amplitude modulation. The kind that's never been able to comb static out of its hair. Now, this oscillator generates a radio wave we call the carrier. It's then fed into the amplifier where it's strengthened, but it's unmodulated, unchanging. It carries no message, or as we say, no intelligence. It's something like the steady, monotonous note of a trumpet. In order to carry a message, the wave must have the intelligence impressed on it. Now, in AM, it's done like this. The intelligence goes into the mic as sound. The mic changes the sound into electrical energy that varies at an audio rate according to the sound. The electrical energy is fed into the modulator where it's amplified. From here, it goes into the amplifier where the fluctuations in electrical energy are impressed on the carrier or radio wave generated by the oscillator. Now, what's that mean? Well, just this. The carrier is modulated. It has its amplitude or strength changed by the fluctuating electrical energy from the modulator. Then the wave that comes from the amplifier looks like this. In this way, the carrier has its amplitude changed by the intelligence. The wave that's transmitted is an AM wave. The varying strength or amplitude of the wave carries the intelligence in AM radio. These waves are radiated by the antenna. Now, what happens in an AM receiver? First, let's take the AM wave as it approaches the antenna of our receiver. The AM receiver picks up the waves. First, it amplifies them this way. Then it feeds them to the demodulator. The demodulator changes the RF amplitude variations back into audio frequency energy. This audio energy is built up or amplified by audio frequency stages. Then it is finally fed into a speaker which turns it back into sound. That's how amplitude modulation works. Of course, we've gone over parts of it pretty sketchily because we're taking for granted you're fairly well grounded in AM radio by now. All's fine in AM. Everything works perfectly when operating conditions are ideal. But suppose there's electrical interference of some sort. For instance, 
Here's our transmitter, and here's our receiver. Electrical impulses of all sorts produce amplitude variations in a radio wave, much the same as the audio signal and the AM transmitter over there to the left. Lightning, for instance, hitchhikes onto the transmitted wave, messing it all up, confusing the intelligence whenever it strikes. Notice how fuzzy the RF wave between the sets becomes at these times. The AM receiver can't separate the amplitude variations that carry intelligence from those that carry just noise. Noise, that's the problem. Now, what are we going to do about it? Well, we know that a radio wave has both frequency and amplitude. So far, the intelligence represented by this audio wave has been transmitted by holding the frequency of the carrier constant and varying its amplitude, its strength, this way. But as we've seen earlier, lightning and other electrical disturbances also vary the amplitude and upset or interfere with the original intelligence. But engineers have discovered that lightning and other electrical disturbances have a negligible effect on the frequency of a radio wave. And so they started reasoning. Why not hold the amplitude constant and vary the frequency or wavelength and make it carry the message? Where AM carries its intelligence by increasing and decreasing the strength of its carrier, this new type would do the same job by varying or modulating the frequency of its carrier. Any static that jumps onto the wave affects only the amplitude, not the frequency. The intelligence, therefore, is not affected. FM radio is based on this idea. The changing frequencies carry the message as clear as a bell. There are several types of FM transmitters used by the Army. To get a good, clear picture of frequency modulation and its general characteristics, we'd better consider a simple set first. Now, just as an AM, the carrier wave is produced, or generated, if you like, by an oscillator. In FM, this carrier wave is called the rest, or resting frequency, when it's unmodulated. That is, when there's no sound being produced. The frequency depends on the values of the coil and capacitor in the tank circuit. Change the value of either the coil or the capacitor, and the frequency changes. Now, if there were any way for the audio signal to change the coil or capacitor values, the result would be an FM wave at the output. You can accomplish this by placing a capacitor microphone in parallel with the capacitor in the tank circuit. This way. Capacitor microphones contain two plates, one of which vibrates when struck by sound waves. Of course, this rhythm is greatly slowed down. In reality, it would be anything from 16 to perhaps 16,000 vibrations per second. When the space in here between the plates varies, due to the vibration, the capacity of the mic will also vary at the same rate. Now, take this in, because it's the way the transmitter operates. The capacity of the mic affects the capacitance of the tank circuit. The capacitance of the tank circuit affects the frequency of the oscillator. The frequency of the oscillator determines the frequency of the RF wave. The RF wave is therefore frequency modulated in accordance with the vibrations of the mic plate. In other words, the frequency now varies at an audio rate when sound hits the mic. When there isn't any sound, the diaphragm of the capacitor mic keeps straight and motionless. The oscillator produces its original or resting frequency. When the first vibration of a sound wave hits the mic, it pushes the diaphragm plate closer to the stationary plate. That action increases the capacitance of the mic. This increased capacitance decreases the frequency of the oscillator. The closer the plates in the mic, the less the frequency and the farther apart the waves. When the diaphragm moves away from the stationary plate, the oscillation increases 
and the waves squeeze closer together. Two complete cycles cause the FM waves to squeeze, stretch. Squeeze, stretch. The higher the note or sound, the higher its frequency. Now, what effect does that have on the FM wave? Just this. Now, take a look at this diagram. This center line with the figure 40 megacycles written below it represents the rest frequency of our oscillator. Now, keep that in mind. Rest frequency, represented by this line, is 40 megacycles. That is, without being modulated, it oscillates the rate of 40 billion cycles per second. Now, what will cause it to vary from rest frequency? Any sound impressed on the capacitor microphone, of course. For example, let's say we modulate the carrier with a 500 cycle note. We get a frequency that swings back and forth above and below the rest frequency 500 times per second. Suppose we increase the frequency of the note to 1,000 cycles per second. See the difference? This 1,000 cycle note causes the FM wave to swing back and forth twice as fast as did the 500 cycle note. <laughs> I know. You're wondering why these two notes of different pitch swing back and forth the same amount across the rest frequency. Well, that brings us to a very important point, or rather two points, rate of change and amount of change. You know now that frequency affects rate of change. Let's see what affects amount of change. Take the 500 cycle note again, but make it louder. Then this happens. See it? We've got the same rate of change across rest frequency, but the distance of the swing to either side of the rest frequency becomes greater. The distance is called deviation. So the frequency of a note or sound determines how many times the swing takes place, and the loudness determines the amount of swing, or deviation. Now, you can see that a great amount of deviation might cause a little trouble. That is, the deviation would go too far and interfere with another FM transmitter. So, the Army sets the maximum deviation for any channel at 40 kilocycles on either side of this rest frequency. In other words, the strongest audio signal that can be used for modulating a transmitter is one that allows only a deviation of 40 kilocycles on either side of the rest frequency. This whole thing, 40 kilocycles on one side and the same on the other, is the carrier swing. Thus, here we have a carrier swing of 80 kilocycles altogether. One more thing, there has to be a separation between channels. That is, we've got to have some method of protecting one channel from possible slop over from another. So, here's what we do. We provide guard bands on each side of the maximum deviation. Each band is 10 kilocycles wide, making a total of 20 kilocycles. The channel allotted to each station consists of two deviation ranges of 40 kilocycles each, plus a 10 kilocycle guard band on each side. That's a total of 100 kilocycles. Remember, what we've seen so far is how we get the FM signal. We showed you an FM transmitter being modulated by a capacitor-type microphone because that was the easiest way of getting the point across. However, the Army uses two other systems of getting FM. They're called reactance tube and phase modulation. There's one big difference between the two. Reactance tube modulates in the oscillator stage while phase does it in some succeeding stage. But no matter what method we use, an FM receiver will pick up the signal, and that gets us to the FM receiver. Naturally, because we're dealing with FM waves, we can't use the ordinary AM receiver. But the two are fairly similar. As a matter of fact, there are only three main differences. Number one is bandpass. 
All band pass means is we've got to have a receiver that will pass the wide band or range of frequencies we're bound to get with FM. Taking care of that is pretty easy because it's just a matter of circuit design. Now, here's a difference we can't brush off as easily as we did the bandpass problem. A frequency modulation receiver has to have some means of cutting or clipping off amplitude variations which, in FM, carry noise, not intelligence. So, we get rid of them. How we do it, we'll see in a minute. And here's the third difference. The FM receiver has to be able to change the frequency variations back into audio amplitude variations. Now, let's see what a block diagram of an AM superhead receiver looks like. To change the AM receiver to an FM receiver, we have to make changes in the set. First, in the circuit to take care of bandpass. Now the amplitude limiting part. In place of this IF amplifier, we put a device called a limiter. This takes care of clipping off the amplitude variations that could hash up reception. All right, the limiter takes care of this. Now, something to take care of our third condition. In place of the demodulator in the AM receiver, we put a device called a discriminator. So, now we've satisfied all three conditions. The bandpass by means of circuit design, the amplitude limiting by means of the limiter, and the translation of frequency variations back into audio amplitude variations by the discriminator. Now we have an FM receiver. But there's a little more to it than just saying we put this here and that there. We want to understand what happens. All right. Here's a simplified diagram of a limiter. It consists of a tuned grid circuit, a resistor, a tuned plate circuit, and bypass capacitors. Also, the sharp cutoff tube. It operates at zero initial grid bias and low plate voltage. Let's see what the action of this limiter circuit is. Here is our FM wave as it leaves the transmitter. It's free of any amplitude variations. But as you saw before, the best laid plans of men and radio go astray, and our wave doesn't stay nice and clean. Amplitude variations creep in, caused by electrical disturbances. So the wave looks like this when it reaches the antenna of our receiver. The frequency hasn't changed, but there are amplitude variations on the positive portion of the wave and variations on the negative portion. Now, let's take this wave through the limiter. The incoming wave induces a voltage in the first tuned circuit. As you see here, the grid of the tube is connected directly to the tuned circuit. Now, with no initial bias, it stands to reason that any positive amplitude swing on the signal will make the grid positive. Therefore, since the grid is positive, it attracts electrons from the cathode of the tube. The electrons move along as a grid current. The more positive the amplitude variations of the wave, the more positive the grid will become, and the greater the grid current flow. But the grid current flow through this resistor produces a voltage drop which tends to buck the positive signal. Now you can see what's going to happen. As the positive amplitude of the wave increases, more and more electrons are attracted to the grid. More and more current flows through the grid circuit. This increased current flowing through the grid resistor develops an increasing negative voltage that acts against the incoming positive signal. 
the voltage drop across the resistor finally becomes so great that it prevents any further increase in positive amplitude of the signal from getting to the grid. Only a certain amount gets through. And what happens to the wave? Just this. The amplitude variations on the positive side of the wave are clipped. And with them go the noises they carry. But we've still got these to worry about the negative amplitude variations. The clipping of the negative amplitude swings is simpler than clipping the positive. You've just seen that a positive swing in signal amplitude turns the grid positive. So we'll naturally get a negative grid when the swing of amplitude is negative. And the more that swing, the more negative the grid will become. And what effect does that have? Say the negative amplitude swing is just beginning. As soon as it begins, the grid becomes negative. That means that the grid will repel electrons that try to hop over from the cathode of the tube. Just a small negative charge in the grid means that not all the electrons from the cathode will be repelled. Some will flow through and get to the plate, thus causing a plate current to flow. But as the negative amplitude swing of the signal becomes larger, the grid becomes more negative. It repels more and more electrons to try to get over from the cathode. Now remember, I said we used a sharp cutoff tube in the limiter. The tube is biased very quickly beyond cutoff. Therefore, it will quickly reach the point where its grid becomes so negative that it will repel any electrons emitted by the cathode. We get this effect on the incoming signal. Here is the incoming signal, just the negative amplitude swing of it. As it becomes more and more negative, the action we just went over on the grid takes place. Suddenly, because of the sharp cutoff point of the tube, plate current ceases to flow and any further negative amplitude variations won't get by. The negative portion of the wave now looks like this. Of course, the negative amplitude swings back up. This means that the grid will become less negative until it reaches a point where the electrons can once more flow through to the plate. Plate current flows again. Now, Combine the positive swing clipping action with the negative, and we get this. Here is our FM signal coming in with all its amplitude variations. It gets to the limiter. The two clipping actions we saw take place. First, the positive. The swing goes up and up until it's stopped, clipped off. Eventually, it starts down again toward the negative swing. It reaches the start of the negative swing and causes the grid to become negative. When the cutoff point of the tube is reached, the negative swing is clipped. The result of these clipping actions is this kind of a wave. Now we have what we went after, a wave with constant amplitude, with all amplitude variations clipped off. The intelligence is still with us, carried in the frequency variations. But we still have a little trouble to get rid of. Notice that the tops and bottoms are squared off. That will mean distortion of the signal. The tuned plate circuit takes care of that. It's able to smooth off any irregularities or sharp corners of a wave by what is called flywheel effect. So the wave that leaves the limiter will look like this. And that's it. Now the wave is ready for the discriminator the device that interprets these frequency variations as audio voltage variations. Now here's a simplified diagram of a discriminator. It consists of a tuned circuit, a diode detector tube, and a load resistor with a bypass capacitor across it.
Now, as you know, a tuned circuit can pass a maximum voltage at its resonant frequency. That is, when the frequency of the incoming wave is the same as the resonant frequency of the circuit. Now, let's see the response curve of the tuned circuit. We'll say its resonant frequency is here. Now, here's a line that represents voltage, varying amounts of it. Any one point along this line represents the amount of voltage at that particular spot. Let this line represent rest frequency. The discriminator is purposely tuned off resonance with the incoming frequency. All right, as long as an unmodulated carrier is coming in, say at this frequency, it means that the output at the discriminator is a steady DC voltage. But now, watch what happens as the frequency of an FM wave, with its rest frequency here, gets closer to the resonant frequency of the discriminator. Now don't forget, here's the resonant frequency of the discriminator. And here's the voltage at the rest frequency of our FM wave. Now, when the frequency of the incoming wave is changed so that it moves closer to the resonant frequency of the discriminator, more voltage is passed by the discriminator. This means that the voltage output of the discriminator will rise in step. When the frequency of the incoming FM wave reaches its peak, the voltage reaches its peak. Now, as the frequency of the wave gets farther away from the resonant frequency of the discriminator, less voltage is passed. Here's the entire action. Watch it. So you can see that the voltage output of the discriminator is an audio frequency voltage, which is exactly in step with the frequency variations. This wave is then fed to the AF amplifiers and onto the speaker exactly as in the AM receiver. FM is the answer to the static problem, static that hashes up perception. Now let's give it a quick once over and call it a day. Okay, first, the FM wave is generated or formed at the transmitter by one of several methods. The simplest, the one we showed in this picture, was by means of a capacitor mic. This capacitor mic, you remember, increased or decreased in capacitance according to the sound that hit it. Increasing or decreasing the capacitance of the mic affected the frequency of the oscillator. The two army methods of getting FM are reactance tube and phase modulation. But no matter what method is used, the FM wave is radiated by the transmitting antenna. The receiving antenna picks it up, it's amplified, and then fed into the device called the limiter. The limiter clips off any amplitude modulations that would come out of the speaker as noise. From the limiter, the now cleaned up wave is fed into the discriminator. This device changes frequency variations back into audio voltage variations. From there, it's into the amplifier and out of the speaker. So, briefly and simply, you've seen the how, why, and what of frequency modulation. Electrical disturbances don't bother FM as far as the static they cause is concerned. When frequency modulation is used, you can be sure that electrical interference won't hash up your messages.